Australia. Uh, welcome to, well, firstly, World Glaucoma Week, um, but particularly to the, our first live Q&A event um, of, a, of a series that we're doing um, over this week um, with a very, very special guest. So allow me to introduce um, Dr. Aparna Raniga, uh, who is a fellow of the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Ophthalmologists and a subspecialist in glaucoma and also a cataract, cataract surgeon. She specialises in uh, MIGS, deep sclerectomy, trabeculectomy and tube shunt surgery. Uh, she's also extensively trained in state-of-the-art topical cataract surgery in glaucoma patients. She's actually a New Zealander by birth, but has trained at leading centres in Switzerland, Canada, and now practice, practices at Retina Associates and Macquarie University Hospital and Clinics uh, here in Sydney, Australia. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Renega. Thank you for that, Richard. Fantastic. Well, I think we've got a really, really interesting um, um, discussion um, for everyone out there today, and that is the treatment and management of different types of glaucoma. So um, why don't we start off by asking, um, you know, are eye drops still the most common form of treatment for, um, for typical forms of glaucoma? Uh, I would say yes. The, the vast majority of patients uh, do not need any significant intervention, either in the form of laser or um, surgery. So yes, the answer is yes. Great, brilliant. All right, okay. Um, and is it common for those with narrow angles that have been treated not to be on glaucoma drops afterwards? So uh, Richard, that question is sort of two pronged. The reason I say that is because having narrow angles doesn't automatically mean that you have glaucoma. Mm -hmm. If you have glaucoma, associated with the narrow angles because it's subtracting the drainage pathway, then you need to treat the narrow angles as well as treating the glaucoma. So treating the narrow angles, um, I'll sort of outline that in my talk later on, um, is about treating the anatomy, whereas treating the glaucoma, um, we know that lowering eye pressure is really the most effective or the only known way at the moment that we treat glaucoma. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Mm, okay. Um, and with uh, eye drops, this is a bit of a question without notice, but um, of the people that you uh, prescribe eye drops in the first instance, I mean, what's the percentage of people who generally do well with them and, you know, don't experience side effects versus the number that you might need to cycle through some different treatments until they find the right balance of side effects and uh, effectiveness? Um, again, it really depends on the situation. Uh, eye drops, yes, they are straightforward to use, um, but they do carry some side effects. Well, uh, apart from side effects, really, the first thing is the eye drops have to go into the eyes and they have to stay there. Mm. So it's, um, you know, it, for people with arthritis, for example, how do they get it into their eyes? Uh, the, the next main issue is remembering to put it in there. It's one thing, you know, sort of handing out prescriptions, but it actually has to fall into the eye correctly. Mm. Mm. Um, uh, I would still talk to people, uh, people who've never um, had treatment before, treatment naive, um, mm. offer them eye drops, but then more increasingly for those patients with open angle glaucoma, I do offer them the uh, selective laser trabeculoplasty if they are a good candidate for SLT, knowing that it then takes uh, the treatment and management of glaucoma out of their hands if it is effective. Now, SLT is not indicated in every patient, nor is it effective in every patient. Um, so it really is working out um, who's sitting in front of me, how, how likely are they to persist with the treatment that I've prescribed, knowing also that eye drops uh, as I said, they're not risk-free, and I'll, I'll, I'll um, detail that in my talk soon. Um, they do disturb the ocular surface. They have some other side effects that I'll highlight as well. Um, so, yeah. That's brilliant. Oh, okay. Thank you. That was, so that was a, a question for me as much as anyone else. So that was a great answer. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Well, listen, um, would you like to go into your uh, presentation? And then I've got a few more questions, uh, both from, from myself uh, and also from some of our patients who are on the call later on. Perfect. So I'll just uh, do this. Um, can you see? Um, I'm Perfect. sharing my screen. Yep. Does that work? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you so much once again. Uh, uh, Glaucoma Australia as well as Glaucos. I've got a few financial disclosures. I've been 
um, uh, provided honorarium from Glaucos as well as Allegan Abbey in the past. Uh, and this presentation is generic in the sense that I'd like to introduce some concepts about glaucoma, glaucoma treatment, and the side effects. Um, this is not uh, complete in any way, and it doesn't replace the advice of your ophthalmologist, your eye surgeon, because treatment of glaucoma is very personalized. So glaucoma, as we know, is, is a chronic multifactorial lifelong condition. We don't have a cure for that. Um, An estimated 200,000 Australians have been diagnosed with glaucoma, but in fact, there is a significant proportion of Australians who are undiagnosed still. They're, they're not aware of it because uh, it's the silent thief of sight. There are no um, signs or symptoms, sorry, there are no symptoms associated with developing uh, glaucoma. So one in 50 Australians will develop glaucoma in their lifetime. And it is a condition that disproportionately affects older people. Um, so something to definitely be aware of as we get older. So these are pictures um, of uh, a normal optic nerve head. So are you able to see um, the arrow, the cursor on my screen? Yeah. Yeah, great. So this is a normal optic nerve head. We're looking here at this sort of moon sort of appearance. Um, the red in the background is uh, the retina, the seeing film of the eye, and the... <clears throat> what look like red tree branches are the blood vessels that emanate through that optic nerve head. So the picture on the left is a, is a normal optic nerve head. That's what we look for when um, a patient presents uh, to us. And the picture on the right is showing uh, that there is a difference uh, in what it looks like. So we're, we're looking for symmetry between eyes. We're looking for um, uh, symmetry between the upper half of um, the optic nerve head and the lower half. And you can see here uh, that pale pink sort of salmon colored tissue is missing here. And that's what glaucoma uh, looks like when we uh, examine a patient. So uh, glaucoma, broadly speaking, can be divided into open angle and closed angle. Um, it is sort of a little bit like plumbing. Um, there's, there's aqueous that is produced by the ciliary body, which is sort of this um, ruffled pale pink tissue, then sort of creeps underneath the iris, the colored part of the eye, and then it drains out uh, through a little narrow canal. Um, with open angle glaucoma over a period of time for unknown reasons that uh, drainage pathway gets blocked up um, and that uh, causes damage to the, the optic nerve head. With closed angle glaucoma, um, the, the drainage pathway itself is, is blocked off and that causes the pressure rise and then uh, you get um, damage to the optic nerve head. So um, essentially there's, there's sort of other ways of, of um, differentiating glaucoma, open versus closed, primary versus secondary, and then pediatrics. So babies can also um, get glaucoma, um, juvenile, which is young adults, um, 16 uh, up to sort of um, 30, and then um, adults um, uh, can also get glaucoma now. Uh, in Australia, open angle, uh, primary open angle glaucoma is most common, which is the case with Caucasians. Uh, closed angle or narrow angle glaucoma is more common in those of um, Asian descent, um, Chinese, Southeast Asian, Mongolians are more likely to have closed angle glaucoma. That's just an anatomical observation. Um, what I mean by primary uh, glaucoma is this, the cause of it is unknown, but a secondary, there's usually an underlying reason for why glaucoma is developed. That could either be um, uh, inflammation in the eye, eye drops, which are causing uh, drops or medications, which are causing that glaucoma or the pressure to go up. It could be multiple operations in the past. Uh, it could be trauma. Um, so th there are reasons for why there is glaucoma, and that's why we call it secondary. <clears throat> 
So as I mentioned earlier, um, lowering eye pressure is the only known modifiable risk factor. There's, there's a number of risk factors associated with glaucoma, of which family history is the most important. So if there is someone in your family who has or had glaucoma, please go ahead and get checked. The goals of treatment are to prevent any further visual loss and to do that effectively by minimizing side effects and maintaining quality of life. Mm. Um, uh, this here, please don't get overwhelmed by this. It, it's mm. showing field tests. Field tests um, are pretty much the cornerstone of glaucoma diagnosis, but also for assessment of progression of glaucoma. So the top left uh, field test is the first time this patient presented um, and uh, what we can see here is overall that's a normal field. Um, that sort of little black square over there is normal blind spot, which everyone has. Um, in 2003, you, you can see over a period of years, there are increasing number of black squares, which means that the eye is not as sensitive to the light presented to the eye during the test. So that's why it's flagging up as um, those black squares and we're just watching to see um, whether there's been any progression now in this case the patient had declined any active treatment he was happy to come back and be followed up but he just didn't uh, he chose not to have any treatment so this is um, as much of um, a valid tool to us as glaucoma specialists but it's also useful to show to the patient you know how things are progressing over time um, okay, so going forward and talking here about treatment, um, eye drops are pretty much the mainstay of treatment. They have been for a very, very long time, starting with pilocarpine um, that was uh, that used to be handed out in sort of the late 1800s. Then Timolol came along and now um, there's lots and lots of eye drops uh, that are available. Laser is uh, was traditionally um, used when um, patients were not able to tolerate eye drops or as a bridge between eye drops and surgery that's now changing and i'll highlight that again um, in a little while and mm -hmm. surgery comes in the form of cataract surgery cataract surgery with devices that are used to lower the pressure and then glaucoma surgery, which is much more an effective at lowering pressure, but also carries more risks um, than either cataract surgery or cataract surgery with devices. So eye drops, as I mentioned, there are um, a ton of eye drops that are that are available um, on the market, and uh, uh, some patients who are listening to this presentation might recognise some of them. Um, they, they, they're useful, they're definitely useful in um, patients who prefer not to have any um, intervention um, and they're effective uh, in open angle glaucoma. But they do require lifelong commitment. So, um, you know, the one bottle of medication is not going to treat or cure the glaucoma for the rest of um, the patient's life. And so it is worthwhile setting up a daily reminder to get into the habit of putting these drops in. So you can either set up an alarm on your phone or you can use an app, whatever it works. Um, but they are limited by um, arthritis. So here's a video of one of my patients who's just sort of squeezing a drop of local anesthetic onto um, a piece of tissue paper. And you can see how he's really struggling to squeeze just one bottle, one drop out. And that's, you know, on, onto that tissue paper that's not even getting up close um, near his eye. Um, there are also memory issues, so dementia, um, and, and these are some of the things that, uh, that limit the effectiveness of eye drops. Um, eye drops are not risk-free. They aren't just putting a drop in and then forgetting about it, knowing that it's going to treat your glaucoma. They all medications have some side effects. Uh, the the type and the severity of side effects vary. Um, often you might start off with um, Zalatan, which is the most commonly prescribed um, pressure lowering drop. Um, and uh, the side effect with Zalatan, uh, as you can see with the, 
the the patient in the middle is it gives you this sort of deep sunken eye appearance over a period of years mm. um, it, it causes the eyelid to droop it just uh, atrophies the fat around the eye and it also causes eyelashes to grow so not my favorite in patients who only need treatment in one eye it also changes the color of the eye as well so this lady's got brown eyes but what if a patient had blue eyes so you then end up over years of use one blue and one brown eye not you know it's not just about vanity it's we're changing um the appearance of the patient um they can also cause red eyes as you can see here in the bottom left and this poor patient is on drops uh, just only in one eye um, and he's got a severe sort of allergic reaction with um peri uh, orbital dermatitis uh, from his eye drop um, drops also uh, worsen dry eye disease. Now, as we know, older people um, suffer from um, dry eyes because the lacrimal gland doesn't make as many tears as we get older. That happens anyway, but putting in eye drops makes that worse. So you're taking a reasonable ocular surface and essentially you're making it worse. So you do need to use some uh, tear film supplements. So this, this video is just showing how these patchy areas of uptake of this um, uh, blue dye, which is breaking up really quickly because um, the eye has uh, become dry from the use of eye drops. So yeah. There are a number of um, uh, issues that prevent people from continuing with eye drops. Um, mm. uh, what I have found fantastic is Glaucoma Australia's new initiative called Sightwise. Um, they have set up this support program that encourages patients um, to continue with their medication, provides them support in terms of understanding their diagnosis and they provide a listening ear um, for um, unexpected scenarios that turn up. Now, language is not a barrier. They've translated this across 100 languages, which is absolutely amazing. Um, so I have um, now encouraged my patients to give them a call and sign up. It's free. Uh, mm -hmm. there's, there's really no reason why not to do this. Okay, so going on then to um, chat about the next step in glaucoma treatment, which is laser. So in patients who have closed or narrow angles, um, they can have something called a laser peripheral iridotomy, and those with open angles can be offered laser trabeculoplasty. So um, the picture here, the cross-sectional picture taken um, on an imaging device shows the narrowness of the drainage pathway. So this here is the cornea, the front windshield of the eye, the edge over here, the tissue at the edge is the, is the sclera, the white coat of the eye, and then these, these sort of little hills that you can see is the iris, the, the colored part of the eye. What you want is for that, um, that pathway there to be nice and wide open, uh, but in fact, it's, it's uh, pushed closed. And so this um, laser iridotomy helps to um, prevent an attack of angle closure when the pupil um, abuts the cornea. It is only part of the treatment for narrow angles. It doesn't control the pressure. So if there is glaucoma associated with narrow angles, then that needs to be treated um, either with drops or with surgery as required. Mm -hmm. What about laser trabeculoplasty? So this has been around in, uh, in a different form with a different kind of laser, but we now use selective laser trabeculoplasty, which is much safer. It is also repeatable if it is effective. Mm -hmm. um, Associated with glaucoma. And um, selective laser trabeculoplasty. This, I might just mute that because I prefer to talk over it. <laughs> um, and so that is essentially showing the drainage pathway, that's showing the meshwork or the pores through which um, fluid from the inside of the eye is pumped out of the eye, both passively but also actively. So the laser, this is me um, with, with a patient um, showing you the machine. This is done in the rooms. You do not need to go to day surgery for this. Um, and, and we treat it um, as much or as little as, uh, as required. Uh, it's got minimal downtime um, 
and uh, it's indicated in, in those with a pressure above 22 millimetres of mercury uh, and with open angles. Okay, so what about surgery for glaucoma? Mm. Um, cataract is a fantastic first step um, because we know that it does lower intraocular pressure. This is not a tremendous drop. Uh, this is probably equivalent to one medication at most, but it does help in lowering pressure for a period of time. There's nothing in glaucoma is curative. It works for a period of time. So a cataract is basically clouding of nature's lens. It is um, the lens sits a third of the way on the inside of the eye. It is not a membrane that you can scrape off the surface of the eye. And by removing the cataract, which in the front to back direction is somewhere between three and a half to five millimeters thick, you're replacing it with an artificial lens, which is one millimeter thick. So therefore, the tissues on the front of the eye have the opportunity to fall back a couple of millimeters, which then helps open out that drainage pathway. Yes. Um, of course, cataract surgery also helps you see better. So there's there's also um, that added benefit as well. Mm. Mm. Um, but cataract surgery really comes into its own enclosed angles because it treats that underlying cause. You can just see how much um, the drainage pathways have opened up here in this patient who's had cataract surgery. Mm. Um, when combined with MIGS, which is a term that was coined probably about 10 years ago with when these stents um, first came out, the eye stent came out first, and there have now been a couple of iterations to make the stent better. Um, so the stent uh, is a bypass which helps for the fluid to pass through the stent rather than going through the drainage pathway and then into uh, the canal which drains that fluid out of the eye. That helps in, in addition to cataract surgery by dropping the pressure a little bit more than just cataract surgery alone. Mm -hmm. And then we come on to glaucoma surgery. So the, the, this is definitely much more effective at lowering pressure, but it is also more invasive. So if there is a need to control more advanced glaucoma, then um, this is definitely the way to go. Cataract surgery in MIGS is not going to effectively lower the pressure by you know five or 10 units, um, but this, this surgery is. So on the far left is, is a trabeculectomy where we are, um, I've made a cut along the surface skin of the eye, pushed that cut surface back. In the white coat of the eye, made a small flap. Underneath that flap is a small hole, um, somewhere around 80 microns in size. That allows for the fluid to percolate underneath, through that hole underneath the scleral flap to form a blister or a pocket of fluid that we call a bleb. Effective, but there are some risks attached to it. Um, mm -hmm. That operation um, has been revised and made better over the last 60 years. Um, newer uh, generations or iterations um, of, of this trabeculectomy is using some devices to make it safer, but still effectively lower the pressure. And at the moment, the two shunts that are on the market are Presaflow and the Zen Gel Stent. Um, so I've given you just sort of a whirlwind tour of um, glaucoma surgery. So mm. th this is definitely traditional. You know, you started off with one medication, one medication, and kept adding medications until you lost control of the pressure. Then you started off with uh, needing surgery. But um, we, as we get better and better at um, uh, finding out new devices which are safer, um, I think that old paradigm is, is being challenged to a certain extent um, mm -hmm. and newer iterations, there's drug delivery devices out there which are really exciting uh, where, you know, you don't have to depend on putting drops in. It's not as effective as glaucoma surgery, but it's definitely much safer. So that's mm -hmm. sort of where we're headed, I'd say, in the next sort of 10, 15 years. Um, so in summary, a chronic multifactorial condition for which we don't have any um, cure. Um, early diagnosis is key. Vigilant follow-up is really important so that we can preserve the quality of life. And the treatment really depends on uh, the severity of the glaucoma at diagnosis and how things change over a period of time. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that overview. I think you, you did cover a, 
a lot of ground in a very short period of time. And I think it was pretty easy to understand as well. So thank you so much. So, I mean, the main, main messages I got out of that are firstly, every treatment is customised to the patient's unique situation. So mm. just because you hear something um, from one particular source or maybe even today, there's no substitute for going and actually sitting down in front of your ophthalmologist and getting them to recommend what they think is going to be best for your specific situation. I mean, mm. the second thing is just because we've had a certain type of paradigm, you know, over the last five to 10 years, as new technologies um, come out and obviously as new data is published, um, you can expect that the paradigm might look quite different in the next sort of five to 10 years as well. So mm. I think, uh, again, it's going to be your your clinician that is the best person um, who's placed best to actually tell you what's the best thing for you. So thank you so much for that. That was um, that was really, really interesting. Um, I might go into some questions first uh, now. So just going back on that sort of cataract surgery thing. So if I am a glaucoma suspect and hmm. I do need to have um, cataract surgery, I've hmm. also been offered um, a stent, you know, during hmm. the cataract surgery. So is this a preventative surgery? Is, is it beneficial for me as a glaucoma suspect? Uh, good question. But having not seen this particular patient, yeah. um, I'm going to assume the reason why they have been offered a stent, assuming, mm. is that they have an elevated intraocular pressure. Mm. So they, they're a glaucoma suspect. They don't actually have the features of glaucoma, but we do know that having elevated pressure above 24 is significant for converting to glaucoma. So um, therefore, they need some sort of treatment. But again, um, you know, maybe lifelong drops is not the way to go. And, and a stent is, is an effective way while you're there at the time of cataract surgery to lower the pressure mm. for a period of time. Knowing that it's not a cure, uh, mm. there is a, a definite chance that the pressure will go up over a period of time. Um, you still have mm. to go back to your ophthalmologist and get checked regularly. Right. All right, so maybe uh, zoom out a little bit. So if, you know, as a glaucoma suspect, you know, what factors determine if I will benefit from early intervention? Um, so it depends on the number of risk factors that are unfortunately stacked against you. So mm -hmm. some risk factors um, that I routinely ask about, number one is, is family history. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a family history of glaucoma, then you're certainly much more likely to develop glaucoma over your lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, so if there's a positive family history, if there are features on examination that suggest you're more likely to develop glaucoma, for example, if you're short-sighted, if there are uh, narrow drainage pathways, if your cornea is thin, um, if there are other risk factors in terms of your general health, diabetes, obstructive mm. sleep apnea, you know, there's so many other things that we look for. It, th this is why I'm saying it, it, it really is very personalized mm. as to, um, you know, what treatment we choose and even at what stage of the disease. So mm. what works now, uh, mm. you know, in March of 2024 may not necessarily even be valid in December 2024. It really depends mm. on the stage of glaucoma and whether there's progression. Mm. So maybe I'll just pick up on that because one of the thing one of the things I've heard a lot from patients is I feel like some of these tests that I'm doing are quite repetitive. It's like I mm. come back in and then I do the test again and again and again. Do you maybe want to talk about maybe pick up the importance of progression and what that means in terms of your decision making and and maybe just to explain why it's important that we keep doing the same tests over and over again. Yes, yeah, so uh, perfect. Thank you. This is my <laughs> pet, pet pet question to answer. Um, all right. So uh, look, we're in twenty twenty four. We're very lucky to have um, scans like OCTs that detect uh, uh, glaucoma, but also analyze for whether there's been any change over time, progression or deterioration. But we also have to correlate that with field testing. So we do know that scans pick up glaucoma much earlier, but we've got to work out whether that's actually true glaucoma and when that's actually going to impair um, the visual uh, function of that patient sitting in front of you. So the only way of assessing whether the glaucoma is progressing is unfortunately repeating those tests. Now, um, most of the time repeating um, OCT and or fields every six to nine months is quite sufficient. But if there's any evidence that 
or, or suspicion that the glaucoma is progressing, then it is worthwhile repeating one or both of them to assess whether there, there has actually been progression um, and we need to take the next step or whether this is just a spurious result. Now, we do know that patients actually get better um, with field testing over a period of time. So there's fantastic um, literature that's been published by um, a group in the UK led by David Crabb that said mm. that, um, you know, you need at least three or more field tests in the first 12 to 18 months of diagnosis to not only establish at what stage the glaucoma is, but also to establish the rate of progression mm. so that you can adequately tailor how aggressive your treatment is to sort of halt that that progression. Mm. That's, that's a great answer. Thank you. And for, for those of you sitting out there, the field test, um, many of you may have done it, but it's where you're actually pressing the button mm. when you see the dots, um, you know, when you're looking through the screen and so on. So. That's a great answer. Thank you so much. So, um, all right, well, listen, why don't we get on to some of the questions from um, people that are out there uh, watching watching the uh, live Q&A. So um, the first one's from Kathy, and I hope I get this pronunciation pronunciation correct. I have a Bayer tube with a scleral patch and AC tap. My mm -hmm. question is, how long can I expect this shunt to last, and mm -hmm. does it have a shelf life? Look, uh, the fact that you've had a Bevel tube um, states that you have advanced glaucoma. Um, Bevel tubes last, uh, in terms of controlling their pressure, with all things being equal, at least eight to ten years. But there are some issues with um, tubes that are put inside the eye. The, you know, I'm not going to go into that in detail here. Um, does it have a shelf life? Uh, again, it just comes back to that premise that we're using the tube to control the pressure, but it's mm. not a cure. It mm. doesn't fix mm. this problem mm. permanently, and hence you've got to go back and have it assessed. Mm. Thank you. Mm. And listen, I understand that um, people are asking quite personal questions about their own situation. It's a bit difficult <laughs> yeah. for me to answer them accurately. We don't actually have all of the I mean, data. It's you lots of second opinions here. <laughs> Exactly. That's right. Um, that's just the nature of this sort of session. People are very interested in um, their own situation and uh, just mm. to get, get some feedback. So, and another one along that line is, is from um, a viewer called Larita. Um, I have had glaucoma since 2008 with a history of retinal and corneal surgeries. I am scheduled for diode cyclophotocoagulation G Pro. <laughs> in my non-seeing right eye because the eye pressure cannot be controlled. Is this safe? And is there another alternative besides this procedure? Um, Larita, I would say trust your glaucoma specialist. Mm. Um, they mm. would have chosen this um, in your best interest um, mm. because uh, this is going to control your pressure. Um, and that's mm. pretty much all I can say. Mm. Have not having seen, um, uh, you know, seeing the patient, it's very hard to comment. Um, mm. Yeah, but certainly if you if you don't have any vision in the eye, um, but your pressure needs to be controlled, uh, cyclophotocoagulation is certainly mm. one way to control it. Mm. Mm. All right, thank you for that answer. Uh, now this is an interesting question, and and I know the data on this is still somewhat contested, but. Um, Question from Cynthia. Uh, my glaucoma has been described as a complication of my diabetes and retinopathy. Um, will this be treated as standard glaucoma? No, no, that's not really um, primary open angle glaucoma. You have underlying reasons as to why you have glaucoma. Um, mm. So it's straight off the bat much more uh tricky to treat uh, mm. than open angle glaucoma. Mm. All right, thank you. Um, next question is from Abdul. Uh, is intake of vitamins such as vitamin B3 being prescribed by any ophthalmologist as part of their patient's glaucoma management? Uh, this is definitely being researched. It's been looked at over the last uh, five to eight years um, and there is very uh, promising uh, results from 